And this technique is called long baseline interferometry. Uh, so I'll, I'll go through and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the, the science results. Uh, and then I will go uh, and uh, talk about how the array of telescopes that's used to produce these results works. Uh, and uh, then talk a little bit about what I do. So I'm, a, I'm an astrophysicist. I model EHT sources. I'm not someone going to the telescope and plugging uh, wires into disk drives. So. Oh, I'm sorry. Event Horizon Telescope. <clears throat> Event Horizon Telescope, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about the future of Event Horizon Telescope imaging, which I think is uh, very exciting. So um, <laughs> a few things. I, I want to emphasize that I'm a theorist. I'm a modeler. So there may be questions about the instrument that I am not able to answer, although I'll, I'll do my best for you. Um, and uh, another point to make uh, is that this experiment is almost entirely classical. So there's really no quantum component to this. The, the uh, electromagnetic waves that are being uh, sensed by the Event Horizon Telescope uh, have large photon occupation numbers. So it looks like classical electrodynamics. Um, and uh, third, third point to make is, uh, I'm on sabbatical right now, so I'm a little more relaxed about this than I might have been otherwise. Uh, so bear, bear with me. Um, all right, so this is the, uh, the first image of a black hole. Um, as you can see, it's an orange donut. Uh, actually, Krispy Kreme uh, gave out free donuts on the day of the announcement. I didn't get any of them. They're one of the biggest disappointments of my career. Uh, but it, it, you know, it looks like this. Uh, this is... Uh, we think a black hole in the center of a nearby galaxy called M87. Uh, so M87 is an important astronomical source uh, because it's, it's the nearest really big galaxy that sits at the middle of a cluster of galaxies. Uh, and it's got a really big black hole in the middle. And uh, this, uh, <clears throat> this big black hole in the middle is famous in part because there appears to be a jet or a, a narrow linear feature of light that emerges from close to the black hole. First detected uh, in an optical image more than a century ago, uh, and uh, now, as you'll see in a second, uh, tracked down very close to the black hole using higher and higher resolution techniques. So the optical images have a characteristic resolution of around an arc second. And uh, the resolution that's achieved by EHT is around 20 micro arc seconds. Okay, <clears throat> uh, this thing uh, is a, a synthesized image. Uh, so this is created from interferometric data using pretty, uh, a, a pretty liberal ap application of priors to, uh, to produce the image. Uh, so EHT is really kind of a software telescope. It's uh, uh, the data that we get from the telescope is uh, not interpretable easily this way. So when you look at this image, you see there's a dark spot in the middle. Uh, that's the black hole. And then surrounding that, there's a bright ring of light. Uh, this light is seen at a frequency of 230 gigahertz, uh, about 1.3 millimeters. And, uh, what generates the light is something called synchrotron process. Uh, so I don't know if any of you remember this from e &M. Okay, so synchrotron process uh, occurs when uh, you have a relativistic electron moving in a magnetic field. So it follows a spiral trajectory along the field, and because it's uh, accelerated, then it, it radiates. And the characteristic frequency at which it radiates is the gyro frequency of the uh, electron, uh, gyro frequency associated with the magnetic field, uh, multiplied by the square of the Lorentz factor of the electrons. So that's the, the characteristic frequency at which you see, you see broadband emission from, uh, uh, from these electrons. So, so that synchrotron radiation comes from a plasma that surrounds the black hole. Uh, the plasma has a 
characteristic density, in this case, of around uh, 10 to the 4 electrons per cubic centimeter. Uh, it's got an embedded magnetic field, which is very important for the dynamics and obviously for the radiation as well. And uh, that embedded magnetic field has a strength of uh, somewhere between you know, 5 and 50 gauss. Uh, so astronomers use... Where does that, where does that field from? CGS. Uh, that's a, uh, that is, at some level, a fundamental unsolved problem in astrophysics in the sense uh, that one can trace the question back to how are cosmic magnetic fields generated. But once you generate them, they and embed them in a plasma which is highly conducting, then they're advective with the plasma. And so ultimately, this field is probably brought in from a region around the black hole as material falls in. So it's advective. And there, there are currents in the plasma that sustain the, the generator. Yeah. 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 What is advective? Oh, uh, so um, uh, so in w when a plasma is very highly conducting, we say that the uh, field is frozen in to the plasma. This is a magnetohydrodynamic regime, uh, which applies in many places in astrophysics. And if it's frozen in, then it gets carried with the plasma as the plasma moves. So for example, if I have a field line threading two points in the plasma and they move like this, then the same field continues to thread. Same field line continues to thread both points. So there's a, a version of the induction equation that describes that motion. You can, you can prove that it, it means that the field lines are frozen in to each point in the plasma. Um, okay, so density, 10 to the 4 electrons per cubic centimeter, field strength, maybe 10 gauss. Uh, uh, you guys all learned Teslas, right? Does anybody use gauss? No? This is a peculiarity of plasma physics and astrophysics, that people use CGS units. Uh, Use your own numbers. Yeah, there's no epsilon knots and mu knots, yeah. which you don't need. Yeah, so I, at least so far we're still getting away with this. I eventually, someday, someone's going to come and tell us that we have to teach in uh, gas units. Uh, so the other feature of this plasma, the other critical parameter, is the temperature. And the temperature is probably somewhere between a billion and a hundred billion Kelvin. So really uh, hot. Is that, that's electron temperature or ion temperature? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, so this is a dilute, so let me, you already know something that I probably have to explain here. Uh, so this is a dilute plasma uh, with uh, ions and electrons and possibly positrons as well. Uh, and uh, because it's so hot and low density, it's uh, collisionless. And so that means that the mean free path to Coulomb scattering is something like 100,000 times the size of the black hole. And in this regime, uh, relaxation probably occurs primarily through uh, wave particles scattering. And, uh, and so there's no particle particle scattering to speak of. And this also means that the ions and the electrons are quite decoupled, and so they can have different temperatures. <clears throat> it's far from clear that you can actually describe them with a thermal distribution. Uh, that's something that we're trying to understand now, too. So this plasma that's around the black hole, um, how, what's the physical scale associated with that? Yeah, um, so uh, the, the short answer uh, is uh, something like 100 AU, but I have a nice graphic for this in the 100 astronomical units uh, distance from the Earth to the sun. So this is a big black hole. Uh, a black hole which is uh, um, somewhat smaller but more typical for the centers of galaxies would be about the size of the sun. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, 
sorry, it would be about one astronomical unit. Uh, the, the black hole in the center of our galaxy is only slightly bigger than the sun. Okay, so, um, oh, and here's my graphic. Uh, it's a size comparison with the solar system. Uh, so you can see Sun, Pluto, Voyager 1, and the uh, other coming up. Okay, now one uh, feature of uh, systems like this, which is important in setting the apparent size, is gravitational lensing. So the actual size is somewhat smaller than the apparent size on the sky. So lensing makes it possible for us to resolve this uh, with black hole. So um, <clears throat> let, let me show you um, just a little bit about the, uh, the science here. One of the most important results from this particular observation is a measurement of the mass of the black hole. And, uh, and this ring has a diameter that you can calculate using general relativity. So this is, if you take one of our intro relativity courses over in physics department, this is one of the first things you'll learn to calculate. Um, <clears throat> so the characteristic size of a black hole is this piece, G, Newton's G, uh, times the mass of the black hole divided by the square of the speed of light. So you can, you can work this out, this has units of length. Uh, and for the sun, this works, where m is one solar mass, this works out to about 1.5 kilometers. Okay, and then to turn this into an angular diameter, which is what we actually measure here, uh, you want to divide by the distance, and then you want to take account of the effects of gravitational lensing. And that is a factor of root 27, which is uh, a huge player here. So, uh, so that gives us an additional factor of five. And at the end of the day, this instrument only has about five pixels across the source. So if that factor of root 27 were missing, then uh, we wouldn't be able to resolve it. So, so we have an estimate of the distance. Uh, we measure this, and that allows us to calculate this. And uh, Prior to this measurement, uh, there, were two, there were two mass estimates for this black hole. One, they came from tracking the motion of stars around the, the black hole, uh, which was roughly consistent with this. And another that came from uh, tracking the motion of gas around the black hole. And that was about half this big. And so uh, these two techniques are widely used to measure mass, black hole masses and astrophysics. And uh, this said that the stellar version was more accurate. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, let me just talk about this uh, lensing uh, a little bit more. So this, these lines are meant to show a bunch of lines of sight uh, going back from the telescope toward the, the black hole, which is here. So the telescope is over there, uh, black hole is here. And uh, the path of the light ray is to deflected by the gravitational field of the black hole. So that's gravitational lensing uh, happens uh, for starlight close to the sun. So during a solar eclipse, say, uh, you can uh, look at the positions of stars that are close to the limb of the sun, and their location is slightly deflected by the gravitational field of the sun. That was something that was uh, first measured by someone named Eddington in the early 20th century, shortly after relativity was put forward and was one of the first important uh, tests of uh, Einstein's theory of gravity, Einstein's theory of general relativity. Okay, <clears throat> so in this case, we're not talking about a light ray that goes, uh, you know, at a 100,000 GM over C squared past a massive body, we're talking about light rays that go about one or two or three of these GM over C squared away from the massive body. So the light rays are not slightly deflected, they can be deflected by the border radians or even many radians um, by the gravitational field of the hole. So 
So, so if you're far from the hole, if your impact parameter is far from the black hole, then your, your light ray is only slightly deflected. Uh, and then as you move in, you reach what's called the critical impact parameter. And then the light rays can wind up on orbits around the black hole, although the orbit is unstable. Uh, and then if you go inside that, you, your light rays trace back to the event horizon of the black hole. So just to, just to show you this picture again, uh, this region uh, corresponds to light rays that come from the, or close to the horizon of the black hole. This corresponds roughly to that critical impact parameter where the uh, things may be orbiting half, halfway around or two times around. And then out here, you just have uh, trajectories that are deflected. Okay. <clears throat> so, so one way of thinking about this uh, is in terms of an index of refraction. Uh, so the effective index of refraction of space-time is something like uh, two times Newtonian potential divided by C squared. So if, if you're an engineer, you're used to thinking about potential in units of energy. Uh, gravitational potential we express in terms of energy per unit mass or velocity squared. Uh, and it's negative around uh, a black hole. And so that's uh, one plus two GM over RC squared. So you can see that the, um, the index of refraction changes by order unity when you get within sort of one or two gm over c squared, which is known as the gravitational radius, by the way, uh, of the event horizon. Okay, and that produces this, uh, this lensing effect. So, so that, that ring is total total reflection. Mm. Uh, yeah, I guess so, yeah. Um, so some of it, uh, so, so you shouldn't think of this as a light storage ring. Okay, there's a, there's a temptation. Well, it a few minutes ago. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we got a synchrotron, but, but it's not a light storage ring. So, right. so uh, it's an unstable orbit. So you, you are seeing uh, light that has gone partway around the hole, but if, uh, the, the intensity of the piece that has gone a half orbit around is actually reduced by a factor of e to the minus pi, um, so which is about 1 20th. And then a full orbit is 1 400th, right, right, right. And, and so on. So you got so a heavy uh, insertion loss. Uh, you have a lot of internal loss of, of a very weak, leaky uh, waveguide. <laughs> loss of, a lossy waveguide. Yeah, it's a really, really lossy waveguide. So, yeah. well, like, if you don't mind, that equation you've written there, the, the dot term would be, you expect that number to be bigger than one, but then in the second line, I think then the Oh, phi is negative. Ah, yeah. so it's going to be, yeah, okay, very good. Yeah. Is there a reason you can't get light to be in a stable orbit around a black hole, like a perfect distance? Yeah, um, you know, you, you can write down the equation of motion for the, the radial motion of the photon. And it looks like a uh, particle moving in an effective potential, which is an inverse parabola, right? So, so the photon orbit is sitting right on top. And that's, that's why it's a very lossy way of cutting. Yeah, yeah it, you know, it, uh, this is for general relativity. It could be that there are alternative theories of gravity for which there's no evidence whatsoever. Um, where you can store light there, you know, it's, we just don't know. Any other questions? Yeah, David, can you, and then, sure. can you talk a bit more about the uh, photon rings? Because uh, Nick was showing me the, you can get like two loops. Uh, right, um, so this is, so, so David knows more than I said, um, so, so this um, stuff that's moving around the black hole forms sort of a glowing ring of gas, which is transparent. Uh, so uh, it, it radiates, but there's almost uh, zero absorption of the light as it passes through that ring. Um, <clears throat> and so what, you, what we see 
is the sum of a direct image, so light that's come straight toward us from that ring, plus stuff that's gone halfway around and then come out toward us, and that's called the n is equal to one photon ring, uh, and then stuff that's gone twice around and then come toward us, that's the n is equal to, sorry, once around, that's the n is equal to two photon ring. And these things, if you assemble them together into an image, uh, produce a sort of diffuse donut, as you see here. And then closer in, you can see a narrow feature, which is an image on the sky of that ring uh, from light that's gone halfway around again. Uh, and then as you go to, to uh, higher and higher n, you approach a limiting curve, which is called the critical curve, which is what that root 27 represents. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, where does all this energy go? Um, if you describe it as a lossy <coughs> waveguide, like what's the loss mechanism here? <coughs> well, it propagates out into the into space. The, so uh, M87 has a luminosity of around 10 to the 40, 42 ergs per second. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, so to factor of 10 to the 7 to get to watts, I think. I think. Uh, and uh, a, a large fraction of that generated radiation just propagates away, um, where an incredibly small fraction is in intercepted by a Venture Horizon telescope. And, uh, uh, and then some of the rest falls into the black hole. Mm. And that actually causes the black hole to grow just a tiny little bit. Okay, any other questions? All right, that's, that's great. Um, okay, so this is kind of the picture of why we see the rain. Um, and uh, just to put this in context, uh, one of the, the big questions about this galaxy is where this jet comes from. Uh, and so I'll, I'll just say a few words about this because this is one of my main uh, science interests. But you can see here an image of the jet that's made at a relatively low frequency. So this is sort of, uh, 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 sorry, this is high frequency. This is made with ALMA which is an interferometer that sits in the Atacama Desert in Chile, and it's what's known as a connected element interferometer. So you take the signal from each telescope and transmit it directly over optical fibers to a central station. Um, so, but it's small. It's, you know, a quarter of kilometers in size. So the resolution of an interferometer is just sort of the diffraction of the infinite. So, um, delta theta is uh, of order lambda over d, where d is the diameter of the, the instrument, which is the distance between the most widely separated uh, antennas, and lambda is the order lambda. Okay, so for ALMA, this is kilometers, and this is 1.3 millimeters. Uh, so then this goes down uh, to uh, 170 millimeters. So this is uh, taken with something called the European DLT-I network. Uh, so this is a network of radio tele conventional radio telescopes uh, in Europe. Uh, this goes down to DLBA, which was uh, one of the first very long baseline array, US-funded instrument with uh, antennas <coughs> all over the world. Uh, was subject to one of the biggest uh, political funding dust-ups in uh, astronomy history. Um, this is a current instrument with uh, GMBA. Each of these, you see, is at smaller and smaller scale, higher and higher resolution. So you, yeah, you're picking out a you're small zooming in. region here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're zooming in on the black hole. And then when you get to a really small scale, you get the, the black hole itself. Okay, so this jet is believed to uh, be powered by the black hole itself. So the notion, you thought you couldn't get anything out of a black hole, but you can. Uh, so most black holes are probably spinning. So black holes have two parameters, the mass and the angular momentum. 
So you can think of them as uh, spinning and dragging space-time around with them. And so if you drop a magnetic field line through that, it gets dragged around by the, uh, by the black hole. And that can, uh, that can energize the field line, produce a wave that carries energy away from the black hole. And <clears throat> the amount of energy in a spinning black hole uh, is enormous. It's like the rest mass energy of the hole. So mc squared. Uh, so there's, there's a lot to work with there. OK. Um, so, uh, so Event Horizon Telescope has done a bunch of follow-ups to that first image. This shows uh, the first polarized image of a black hole. Here, the striations are, do not indicate actual features in the total intensity. They only indicate the direction of the polarization vector. Okay, so this is kind of a visualization technique that people use. Uh, the, so the, the electric vector polarization angle uh, is like this here. And that tells us something about the orientation of the magnetic field in the source. Is that the Bohr plane bug? Yeah, it, um, yeah. Uh, so what that probably indicates is that the magnetic field, which is in synchrotron radiation, usually perpendicular to the, pol the polarization of the generated radiation, um, <clears throat> means the magnetic field goes like this. And, uh, and it's being and dragged around by the black hole. The spinning from here. Yeah. 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 So that potentially is direct evidence for the spin of a black hole, but we've, we've, we've got a lot of work to do there to make that case persuasive. Is this a new image of the 87 No, th this is an old one. Uh, so there was another image, polarized image of a black hole that came out yesterday. Um, and that was the black hole in the center of our galaxy. But, but this is with, so this is the same image before, just you know, a few years later, you figured out how to get the polarization out of the utilities? Right, so, so this array of telescopes operates in a campaign mode. So every one of these telescopes is a, you know, sort of a $50 million instrument that's owned by some you know, national research authority. And uh, we have to coordinate all these and get simultaneous time on all of them and record data of them all simultaneously. And uh, so there was a 2017 campaign when we took the first data with the full array, which I'll show you in just a second. Uh, and, uh, and we've still been reducing the data from that run up until yesterday. Uh, but there's, uh, there's data from 2018. Uh, and then there, you know, we didn't get data during the pandemic. And also, we didn't get data in 2019, partly due to weather and bandits at a Mexican telescope uh, that prevented the observing crew from going up. Uh, and then we have data in 2021 uh, and 2022 that's going to be uh, appearing in the future. OK. Uh, so there's, that's consistent with left-handed spiral. So this is the first image. This is the second image of the black hole. This is the first image of the one in the center of our galaxy. Uh, it's bigger, um, but it's harder to image. And I, I, uh, let me just give a short explanation of this. So the, uh, the configuration of the plasma around the black hole changes on kind of an orbital time scale, which is the time scale for light to go around. Okay, that is proportional to the size of the black hole. So this gravitational radius, or gm over c squared, is the scale that the light has to move across uh, in order for the plasma configuration to change. Um, and that is much bigger for the black hole in the M87. That's like 100 AU uh, in size. So that only changes over a time scale of weeks. The, uh, the black hole in the center of our galaxy is much smaller. It's sort of the geometric mean of one astronomical unit in the solar radius. Um, and, uh, and so it changes very quickly on sort of a 20 second, you know, 40 second time scale. So one of the, the central 
assumptions that went into all imaging algorithms prior to EHT was that the source is time steady. And so we had to invent algorithms to deal with that before we could make this image, which is meant to represent a time average of the total intensity from the source. Okay, so that's, um, that's the intro. I wanna talk a little bit about how the array works. Um, so here uh, are the telescopes that participated in the 2017 campaign. So <clears throat> there's uh, one in, uh, in Arizona. There's uh, an array of telescopes that's operated by the Smithsonian that's in Hawaii and sits on top of Mauna Kea. There's a big uh, astronomical telescope reservation on top of the mountain, uh, which has been the subject of huge controversy. But um, uh, that was an important element. Here's the one in Mexico, uh, which is on top of an uh, extinct volcano, hopefully. <laughs> um, there's the uh, Alma, which sits in the uh, Atacama Desert in Chile. And then there's something called the South Pole Telescope, which I think Joaquin Vieira probably talked to you about uh, earlier in the year. So the millimeter wavelength telescope at the South Pole, that would be the one in the middle of the top. Okay, so, <clears throat> so the procedure for running one of these campaigns involves, uh, first of all, getting time on all these telescopes, getting everybody to agree. Uh, each of these telescopes have its own science agenda, its own separate funding stream. Uh, there's, there's no one who can make everybody stand up and do the right thing. <laughs> so that's a major problem. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, there has to be specialized equipment that's brought to each telescope. So that specialized equipment is a, a rack of electronics that includes a, a very accurate clock. Uh, and then an array of disk drives. So the, the total amount of data that's produced in one observing campaign is about, uh, or in the 2017 campaign, it's about four petabytes of data. Oh. And you'll, you'll understand why in just a second. Um, and, and one of the things that made this experiment possible was the drop in cost of storage with time. So, so that's why it happened now and not in you know, 1980 because people thought of doing this in 1980, but they, you know, they would have needed the GDP of the United States to buy enough storage. Okay, <clears throat> so, so the procedure is to get this rack of electronics to each telescope, get it all plugged in and operating, uh, and then when the weather is good at each site to run, uh, to run the experiment, so all, they all point at uh, an object, for a certain amount of uh, time that's called track and uh, take data for a few hours on each source. And then they record the voltage stream at each telescope um, onto, uh, onto disk. So, so you're, you're digitizing the voltage stream and then recording that. Uh, and then you transport the arrays back from the sites to a central facility. Okay, so uh, uh, there's petabytes of disk space. Actually, one of the things that delayed analysis of the data from 2017 was that some of these disk drives were at the South Pole. And the data is taken in the Northern Spring, which is the Antarctic fall, and we couldn't get it out until November. So, um, <clears throat> so then you, you take them back to a central site. There are actually two sites that do this. One is in Massachusetts and the other is in Bonn, Germany. Uh, and then you correlate the signals. So here are these, so this is meant to be the, the voltage stream. Uh, this indicates which site you're at, and you're taking a correlation of the signal between uh, pairs of sites. Okay, so this, this correlation procedure of signals from pairs of telescopes uh, produces, at the end of the day, the amplitude of a single Fourier component of the brightness on the sky. Okay, so uh, so what you're what you're doing is you have some you have two telescopes they're they're pointed at some point on the sky, uh, and 
you're, you're measuring a time delay between the two. And the time delay changes depending on where you are in the sky. Right? And in addition to that, the time delay has a, a, a periodic component, which is gives you the, uh, the 48 amplitude on the sky. I'm, there's no way I'm going to be able to explain this in, compactly enough. But um, there's lots of great uh, resources online. So correlation of pairs of signals gives you what's called the visibility amplitude, which is just the Fourier amplitude of a single Fourier component of the surface brightness on the sky. Correlation of triples of antennas gives you uh, what's called a closure phase. Okay, so you can't measure the phases of the Fourier components directly because of corruption of the phases by atmospheric, uh, <clears throat> by the atmosphere. Um, but you can get this uh, quantity called a closure phase, which is the sum of three uh, Fourier phases. Um, you, you can get that, uh, with, and it is independent of atmospheric corruption. So with these amplitudes and phases, you can then attempt to reconstruct the image. Okay, so I have a great graphic of this, if that, none of that made sense. Um, <clears throat> this is uh, meant to show reconstruction of an image of a teapot orbiting between the Earth and Mars. Uh, the teapot is at a temperature of something like 10 to the 11 Kelvin, uh, since it's detectable by EHD. <clears throat> and uh, uh, we're gonna let this go, and you can see the pairs of telescopes uh, getting a sight line to the source on the sky as the Earth turns. <clears throat> okay, so there's correlation between a telescope in Spain and the South Pole. <clears throat> and then gradually you add in information for more and more baselines, pairs of telescopes, and you get an image of the teapot. Okay, and you can see in that first, first go round, you can see that you're getting information about a single Fourier component, and then you're adding in more and more Fourier components. However, uh, it's something that is not talked about enough. The reconstruction of the image is not unique. You don't have access to all of the Fourier components. And so uh, in making an image, you have to make a guess at some of the missing information. And uh, that's, that's what's been done in making the EHT images. All of the science, by the way, is done directly with the interferometric data products. And so, you know, it's not subject to the standards of the reconstruction. Algorithm. So is, it, is that reconstruction then done to some, some algorithmic level, or is it something that AI would be able to address in the future? Yeah, uh, there's, there's multiple algorithms that are used to do the image reconstruction. Uh, people are also playing with machine learning tools to do this. Uh, Katie Bowman, who had an offer from our department here in ECE, is one of the leaders in this. Um, I wish she had come here, but she didn't. Um, uh, but there, there are uh, five um, uh, full pipelines that are used to reconstruct the images, and they give largely consistent results. Yeah? Is the problem not having enough um, components to totally reconstruct a unique signal based on the number of telescopes? Mm -hmm. Yes. Or the time that you would enter? Um, it's based on the number of telescopes. So if we had enough telescopes, uh, then we could just directly reconstruct the image immediately. Uh, so <clears throat> there are two, two things about that. So one is that there's a proposal that's being evaluated right now uh, at the National Science Foundation to expand the array. And that would get us a lot closer to unique reconstruction of the image. Uh, second is that there's a similar low frequency array that's being designed by Caltech and probably funded by Schmidt Futures, uh, which has 2,000 telescopes in it. Uh, so these are cheap sort of satellite dish things, low frequency dishes. And, uh, and with that, you also don't need a fancy reconstruction algorithm. You can just you know, 
directly infer with the images. Yeah, yeah. Um, this funding proposal from the NSF you just mentioned, um, surely it's not like building new arrays. Is it just connecting things like, I mean, I don't know what the frequency is. No, it's, it involves building new sites. Really? Yeah. But would those be general purpose radio economy sites? Yeah, well? yeah, for part of the time, yeah. Yeah. But the, I was going to talk about the future of this business in the end. But one of the goals of EHG is to be able to revisit these sites uh, every couple weeks and make a movie. And so you can only do that if you have control of the, pretty good control of the instruments. Um, so the, the new sites include sites in uh, Mexico and Wyoming. Um, yeah, and elsewhere. Massachusetts. <laughs> yeah, I don't remember exactly what the diameter of the dish is, but it's not super uh, super big. It's not like the 30 meter uh, Pico Plato uh, or the 50 meter Mexico. Okay. <clears throat> so, any other questions about how this how this operates? Okay. So, I want to talk a little bit about what shapes the, the images, because um, this is what I do. So we do cool simulations. And uh, the notion here is that there are three things that produce the images that we see. So one is the plasma flow around the black hole. Another is gravitational lensing by the black hole. That makes a, a ring with a dark spot in the middle, which is known as the shadow of the black hole. Uh, and the third thing is electron physics. So what energizes the electrons that actually produce the, uh, the radiation? Okay, so in order to sort of help communicate this, uh, we went out to uni primary school, uh, and uh, we, we got a drone, uh, and we built a simulacrum a black hole, a pretty, uh, so has anyone been to uni primary? Uh, okay, so it's in south of campus. Uh, so this is meant to represent the black hole in the middle. And then we have some fourth and fifth graders running around the black hole who are meant to represent the plasma flow around the black hole. Uh, and, and they both circulate around the black hole and they fall into the hole. So. <clears throat> there they go. Uh, we actually got money from the NSF to do this. <laughs> uh, we, we can't get money to pay graduate students, but we can get money for this. Um, so, uh, so you can see that there's a sense of circulation. There's angular momentum of the uh, plasma. And uh, through dissipative processes and through uh, magnetic field, uh, connections, the angular momentum gradually gets given up and material moves toward the center as that happens. Uh, so eventually the plasma accretes. And in the center of our galaxy, this happens very, very slowly. So the amount of mass that that black hole is gaining is the scaled equivalent of a human being, human being eating one grain of rice every million years. <laughs> So there's very little stuff on it. <clears throat> okay, so this, this exaggerates that a little bit. Anyway, some, you know, some plasma is more enthusiastic than others. <laughs> <laughs> this is the most fun I've ever had. Uh, <laughs> the ring is from a big enough ring. They all <laughs> want to go in the center. Yeah, they all, yeah, you know. And then we, there's the PI coming in. <laughs> we, we let it evaporate. Okay. <laughs> So, um, so this is the plasma flow, which we model using a fluid dynamics code. Uh, so it's a, actually a very standard algorithm for fluid dynamics in a very exotic setting. So I think if anyone here is involved in, there used to be a center for the simulation of advanced rockets on campus. I don't think that exists here anymore, but, but some of the techniques that they use were very similar to the techniques that, that we use. 
Um, <clears throat> okay, uh, so the so that's component one. So we do a fluid simulation. Component two is lensing, and the way we take account of this is through ray tracing. So uh, you know your video games use ray tracing, but in your video games the rays move on straight lines. Okay, so here we have to solve an ODE to understand what uh, path the light takes around the black hole. But other than that, it's the same same basic idea. So you're treating it like a weight guy. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, so I think the, the boundary conditions are not important here. So we treat, you know, we treat the photons like particles, and then we integrate the particle trajectories. So I think that's not exactly what you would do. In a, that, that's the distinction uh, uh, from a, a weight guy. Okay. So so here's the picture. We take a hydrodynamic simulation of the plasma. It's a magnetohydrodynamic simulation. Uh, we assign a, a distribution of electron energies so that we can figure out what the emergent radiation is. And then we do this radio transfer or, or ray tracing calculation. And what we get at the end is all four Stokes parameters. Okay, this is the right audience for Stokes parameters. Uh, we get all four Stokes parameters as a function of frequency, position on the sky, and time. For our uh, for our model, yeah. Do you take into account any of the effects of like dust in the plasma and how that affects mm -hmm. the simulation? Of yeah. Uh, so, so we treat the plasma as composed entirely of hydrogen, but and there's no doubt heavier elements around, as there is everywhere in astrophysics. As astronomers call those metals, by the way. Uh, <laughs> And you know everything about helium is a metal, <laughs> and uh, uh, those that dust, which is present in the general interstellar medium around the sun, is you know tiny little soot grains, graphite grains, and things. Um, that is completely destroyed at these high temperatures. So here, there is not a bound electron in sight. Okay, so everything is fully ionized. Oh, yeah, I guess my only. My thought and that kind of answers it was if whatever byproduct of that affects the magnetic field in general, then that would be a <laughs> yeah, it could. Yeah, so there's there's a lot of interesting unmodeled physics here. Uh, we we think that we've got it at sort of the fifty percent level, and uh, you know the, the question is what to do next to get it to a really predictive level. I think one of the leading corrections for modeling the center of our galaxy is probably that the plasma is predominantly helium rather than mm -hmm. hydrogen. So the black hole in the center of the galaxy is fed by a star which is composed mostly of helium and is blowing a wind that then falls onto the Thanks. Okay, okay I'm, I'm just gonna wind up soon, but I'll, I'll show you a, a movie. Uh, uh, this is a movie that my graduate student Abhishek produced. This is a model of the black hole at the center of our galaxy, which is largely consistent with uh, data. <coughs> okay, and uh, we can we can make the model at arbitrarily high resolution, so we don't need to spend a trillion dollars to float another antenna in space. Um, and, you know, we can just uh, do the calculation. And you can see here that there's this critical curve here with the multiple rings that David was talking about there, which are images of the, the plasma around the black hole. And then this region corresponds to lines of sight that end on the event horizon. This is direct emission from stuff that's falling into the black hole. Uh, and then this region is where the, the sort of disk, uh, you can think of it as sort of a ring of gas that's glowing meets the event horizon of the black hole without having to show All right. And uh, so one orbit is roughly? Uh, yeah, you know, there's a clock uh, down there for this. Uh, so that's that's a realistic amount of time. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's, it's moving. The amazing, you know, you think about astronomy as being about 
some kind of static arrangement of stars on the sky. But here the, the astronomical source is changing on a short time scale. In fact, there are, there are stars that orbit this black hole whose trajectory can be tracked of a sort of decade-long orbital time scale. And that's what won Reinhard Denzel and Andre Gay's Nobel Prize a few years ago. Is that pretty firmly established that this was a black hole? <clears throat> okay, um, I've got one last thing to say, um, which is about future directions. So, one thing that we can do, you know, the resolution of the instrument is lambda over d. We can't change d, d is the diameter of the Earth. <laughs> um, so, well, we, we can. We can put a satellite in space, but that's extremely expensive. So we're trying to do that. Uh, it's, you know, it's going to take a decade to do that. Lambda, we can change, but we're limited by Earth's atmosphere. So, uh, so we can go to 345 gigahertz, uh, 0.7 millimeters. Um, so there's a, uh, there's a window in the atmospheric absorption at that wavelength, and so we, we can do that. So that's one of the things we're doing now. Another is getting repeated access to the telescopes uh, and then new sites. So there's a plan to build a, a funded plan to build a new observatory in Namibia uh, at uh, so called the African Millimeter Telescope. Uh, and then finally, one can go to space to change D. Okay, so that's it. Um, thanks for listening. Any questions? Yeah, I, I think that, uh, so, so just to fill in some of the astronomical details there, uh, there are stars uh, being born all the time out of the interstellar gas, and we can observe them directly fairly nearby, <clears throat> and those also show jets of gas moving out. Those don't move at relativistic speeds, they move at sort of a few hundred kilometers per second, which is comparable to the escape speed from the sun. So I think the, the common thread there is that there's a spinning body that drags the magnetic field around in the center. And, and that's it. I mean, this, this effect that produces the jets in M87 is not that, mm -hmm. at some level, not that mysterious. The field lines get dragged by the black hole. Same thing happens in the phase star. Mm -hmm. Only in that case, you know, the escape speed is speed of light. And so those, are, those jets are moving close to the speed of light. So is the question then like a chicken or the egg kind of thing? Or is you're asking is the field causing the jet or is the jet producing? Um, yeah. um, uh, I think, you know, almost no matter what you do in astrophysics, you wind up with plasma that's contaminated by magnetic field. <laughs> you can't get away from it. Uh, and so it gets dragged in under any Any other questions? Optics question. <laughs> yeah. uh, are you running these like particle in cell simulations for the plasma? Uh, um, yeah, so, so we are not. Uh, and this is a point of contention in my community about what the best approach is to do this. And you know, there's a bunch of plasma physicists who come in and say, well, these guys are doing fluid dynamics, but the only really first principles way to do this is using what are called particle and cell or PIC simulations, where you have a Monte Carlo sampling of the electrons and ions and follow their trajectories. <clears throat> so the thing about PIC simulations is that they're unbelievably expensive. <laughs> so you need you know, weeks of time on the largest available supercomputers to do something that's even close to the, what we've done with the fluid simulations. So the state of the art just hasn't gotten there yet. Uh, so my personal 
opinion is that we need to do PIC simulations uh, to understand some of the electron energization problems, but uh, that uh, for the sort of global structure of the flow, fluid is probably a way better approximation than it should be. And, and just to give you a sense of how calibrated this is, um, it turns out that there's another collisionless plasma right nearby that we can study in situ, which is the solar wind. Okay, so the mean free path in the solar wind is about the, the Coulomb mean free path, is about the distance from the sun to the earth. And so <clears throat> that turns out that's extremely well described with a fluid model, except in some very narrow features at the bow shock of the earth and at the bow shock of the other planets. So, um, uh, so I, I think fluids are a big part of the answer and that we need to calibrate them with PIC models. It's a multi-scale problem. Uh, are there anything special about these uh, millimeter uh, like antennas that you use for the uh, telescope? Well, you know, the surface accuracy has to be much higher than for a conventional microwave dish, right, like that you see over there at WILL. Um, so it needs to be accurate to within, you know, something like lambda over 16 or lambda over 32 or something. Um, so very high accuracy dish, stiff, um, uh, stiff dish. Uh, and then the receivers, of course, are pretty, uh, pretty special. Uh, so those also require, um, you know, somewhat different um, configurations, cold, cold, cold doer, for example, um, things that you, you don't have in some classical microwave technology. I mean, sometimes you do, but in general, we can do without that. Okay, any other questions?